When I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. I want to tell you that as we move into Acts chapter 2, as we talk about the Spirit of God empowering the believers to express something to those around them, this is what they are expressing. This is the message that they took with them to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And this is the same message that rings true today that we ought to be spreading with Luling, Booty, even those New Orleansers. I think that's wrong, but you know what I mean. Uh, even those other Louisianians and Americans and ultimately to the uttermost part of the world. This is the same message, the gospel of Christ Jesus, that we are expected and commissioned and commanded by Christ himself to go and to proclaim. And the question that we asked last week is, are we doing that? Are we doing what Christ has commanded us? Are we being obedient to the commission that he has brought us into in the plan and the purpose of God that he has for us? We talked a little bit uh, about uh, looking at the book of Acts, especially uh, understanding why and and who is writing, uh, kind of from a 35,000 view. Uh, And we asked the question, why Acts? Why Acts? Uh, And I gave you four primary reasons. Uh, So I I want to repeat those in case you weren't here, uh, or also as uh, math in my days uh, was taught, uh, because when I go over Isaiah's homework, I typically have no clue what he is doing in math. It it does not look like math to me. In my days, when you learn math, it was through repetition. Uh, and that is not necessarily how math is being taught today. Whether for good or bad, I do not know. Um, I know that he does math in his way way better than I could possibly do it. Um, and he's on a first grade level. Uh, but uh, math in my day, Saxon math. Anybody remember Saxon math? Anybody have that? Look at that. A few, few, th- those are those, those teachers. That's, that's what it was. Oh, oh even with a student. Uh, It was through repetition. So I'm going to repeat what I mentioned to you last week. Why Acts? Uh, And we're starting the sermon series in Acts, first of all, in order to shape the mission and vision of West St. Charles Baptist moving forward, especially as it pertains to kingdom building. So I want us to shape a mission and vision for our church so that we might understand what it means to partake and participate in the kingdom of God. Secondly, in order for the narrative of Acts to inform us of the necessity of the Spirit of God in a few different things. Regeneration, godly living, and evangelical witness. So what is the Spirit's role and purpose in our lives when it comes to regeneration, godly living, and evangelical witness? We talked about that some last week. We'll talk about that more this week. And also, thirdly, in order for West St. Charles Baptist to rely more deeply upon the Spirit's ability and not our own. I told you last week that you could have every program under the sun and apart from the work of the Spirit, it will all be in vain. There's a combination of things that you'll see that we need in order to do what God has asked us to do, and that is the Spirit's help, obedience through prayer. If you want to make an impact in this community, in the lives of your coworkers or the students that you participate in school with, the people that are in your family, if you want to make an impact, it is the Spirit working through you in obedience and with prayer. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Nothing is going to happen apart from the Spirit moving their dead heart to life and then repentance and faith following. It's not going to happen. You cannot save yourself. You cannot save someone else. You can be as charismatic as you want to be, but your words will do nothing apart from the Spirit's help. Bible tells us that over and over and over again. 
Fourthly, to remind us that the supernatural and miracles won't sustain the soul, but Jesus can sustain the soul. See, Acts has quite a few miracles. It has quite a few supernatural events that take place. And oftentimes, as we go through the book of Acts, that can direct our focus towards that, the supernatural things that were happening. But I want us to remember that none of that will sustain your soul. I.e., for example, look at the people of Israel. They saw mighty wonders in Egypt. They were miraculously saved by Pharaoh's army, by God taking a wind and separating the sea so that they could walk across. And as the last one walked across and Pharaoh's army was following them, chasing after them, they saw God close the sea on Pharaoh's troops. He led them by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He fed them in the wilderness and sustained them for 40 years. They saw all sorts of signs and wonders. And as they made their way into the wilderness, it wasn't but a couple of days or weeks. And they made a graven image of a gold calf to worship. This God who has brought us out of slavery, out of Egypt, showing us signs and wonders, and yet we're just going to go and fashion together a golden calf and we're going to bow before it. Some metal. Cow. Moo. Signs and wonders will not sustain us, but Jesus can sustain us. The book of Acts is filled with signs and wonders, and yet that is not the focus of the book of Acts. If you look at the front, it probably says Acts of the Apostles, which is the traditional name of the book of Acts in most scriptures. But I want to tell you that the focus of the book of Acts is God himself, in the person of Jesus and by the work of the Spirit. That is who we should focus in on. Uh, that we should see is doing the work. Because as we're going to see today, that these apostles, uh, they were no one special. Yeah, they walked with Jesus. They saw the risen Lord. But they were no one special because outside of the Spirit's help, where were they? Hiding in an upper room. Cowards thinking they were going to be next. In a locked room, mind you. Remember, even on that first Sunday, the first day of the week when Jesus rose, when he appeared to them, seven days later, what position was the lock on the door? Locked. It was locked. He appeared to them in a locked room, the upper room. They were hiding in fear. And yet today we're going to see that the Spirit enabled them to do something miraculous in and of itself. And why does Luke write the book of Acts? Well, in Luke chapter 1, we see that he writes this. It seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught, uh, so that we might not just think and half-heartedly believe, that we might know the things of Christ Jesus, what he has done in his life, death, burial, and in his resurrection. Luke writes so that we may know these things, have certainty of these things based on eyewitness accounts. And we see here that that thread continues. We see that in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. And what is the book of Acts? going to be about? What's the focus of the book of Acts? A continuation of that message. So the book of Luke, what Jesus began to do and teach, and the book of Acts, what he continues to do in the lives of believers empowered by the Spirit. We talked about Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Uh, we talked about the power, the purpose, the plan, the three Ps. Uh, and we talked about who the Holy Spirit is, not what it is, but who he is. Uh, and we know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead, that he is a person, 
He can be lied to, he can be grieved, he teaches, he testifies, uh, and we're going to see some of the things that he does today. And lastly, last week, we ended on this note that Jesus is ruling and reigning from the throne. And for those of us who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who have the same spirit of Christ residing in our hearts and lives, he is ruling in our lives as we speak. And if he isn't, then you are not being obedient. Christ is on the throne. And the question for us is, is he on the throne in our own lives? That is what we must ask ourselves. So we come now to Acts chapter 2, and we'll read down through verse 21. Luke records this, and God's word says this. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes with great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Heavenly Father, as we begin this this sermon, as we look to your word, as we look to Jesus and this faithful witness of what he is doing in the early church, Father, I pray just as it was prayed before that the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you, that you would teach us from your word, that you would edify us by the work of your spirit, that we would become more and more like Jesus this day. Before we leave this place, that you would regenerate those who need regeneration, uh, call them unto salvation, for your word tells us that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the hope that we have in the work of of Christ, but also for those who need to grow in their faith. Father, we pray that you would do that in and through each and every one of us. And it's in your name we pray and we expect you to do great and mighty things. Amen. We come now to Acts chapter 2, and uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are wondering, well, what in the world is he going to preach on? Uh, I simply want to give you what the text offers uh, this morning. Uh, I want to give you, I think I have three points. Let me go and check. Yeah, three points, like normal. So if you're a note taker, uh, you, uh, you get ready for those three. They're coming. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, I want us to see, first of all, the entrance of the Spirit. And we're going to talk about this for a little bit. The entrance of the Spirit. If we go back to the first few verses of Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is what takes place. And I want us to understand this in the context in which scripture records this. We see here uh, the time and the place that the Spirit enters. The time and the place. 
look at what verse 1 says. When the day of Pentecost arrived. Uh, now, most of us know what this day is. Uh, so we know that after uh, 50 days after uh, the time of the Passover, a specific day of the Passover, uh, 50 days after, there is a uh, type of um, Jewish festival and celebration in Hebrew, it's Shabbat. Uh, here it's known as Pentecost. Uh, it, it's all the same thing. Uh, it is basically uh, a period in between uh, the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the grain. Uh, and what is taking place, uh, and we can even look at some of the context clues here in this chapter 2 of the book of Acts, uh, and see that this was uh, a festival, um, and I would liken it to any festival that people celebrate today. Uh, now, we know that at this festival, there is more likely an emphasis on what? Alcohol. One, because it's of the first fruits, right? Uh, it's part of the crop that has come in, and, and they've taken it, and they've taken this new, quote-unquote, wine that is referenced later in chapter 2. Uh, and more so, we see that this is probably a huge factor in this festival, uh, because as things progress, uh, all of those people who gathered around thought that these men were drunk on new wine. Uh, so I want you uh, to understand that the Spirit of God arrives on a Jewish festival where there's probably some drinking, but there's also something else taking place. There are people from all over the known world who have descended upon Jerusalem. God works in mysterious ways. And yet, if we look at this, we see that what better place to jumpstart the church. Uh, instead of getting all of these people and sending them out, God, just as he did with the Virgin Mary, moved governments and nations in order to get Mary to a specific place and specific time in order to have Jesus, in order to fulfill the prophecy. God is moving people and nations into one city on the day that the Spirit arrives. Almost as if God knows better than we do in a lot of areas. So the day of Pentecost arrives and we see that they were all together in one place. I like this. I like this phrase, but there's two connotations to this. They were all together in one place because one, they were hiding. Uh, they were hiding. They were somewhat of cowards. And, and this, is, this is fine because we would be cowards outside of the help of the Spirit as well. But they were in an upper room, and they were together. But I also, also want to see the flip side of this, that they were unified. Just as the church is unified by the Spirit of Christ. That oftentimes, I say this, that I would not hang out with most of you on any day of the week if it were not for you being a part of the family of God. And I know for a fact that most of you would not want to hang out with me. But we have something in common that, that cuts through this secular view of life. There's something that is transcendent, that is above all, uh, that we all share in common, and that is that God has saved us by the work of Christ and by the power of God. The Spirit. So this is what we have in common, that we were once sinners and Christ has rescued us from sin, death, hell, and the grave. That's a good thing to have in common. That's a good reason to meet together in fellowship with one another because God has saved us and we are going to be spending eternity together. So we better get used to it now. This is what one of the roles of the church is that we fellowship together, that we help one another, that we edify one another, that we encourage one another. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. And here, this group of about 100, we're together and what takes place? The Spirit comes as they are in one place, praying together in unity the Spirit comes, and we see that in verse 2. And I want to see 
the language surrounding this entrance of the Spirit. Oftentimes we get this wrong. One of my pet peeves is a certain couple of songs. Uh, Hillsong has one. I think Elevation Worship has one. And don't get me wrong, I love these songs. I love these songs. Fire Fall Down, anyone ever heard of that? Fire Fall Down, Fire. And you repeat it about 80 times, that's the song. Okay, that's not a good thing. I know what they mean, but they don't know what they are saying. Because anywhere in scripture where fire descends is a sign of judgment. Being baptized by the Spirit and those baptized with fire, okay, that is a bad thing. Baptized with fire means you're going to endure eternal damnation and torment forever and ever and ever. Here we talk about fire coming down because the Spirit, uh, there's a simile here talking about a, a tongue of fire that is not what is taking place. Fire coming down is always really bad. Pet peeve over. All right. I want us to see that the scripture here uses two similes. If you don't know what a simile is, they are like and as. I want you to see this. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound, what's the next word? Like a mighty rushing wind. Was it a mighty rushing wind or was it sound like a mighty rushing wind? Like. Let me answer it for you. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, what's the next simile? As a fire, was there actual fire or was it a simile trying to point to something that was spiritually happening in a physical way? Yes, correct. As, simile, again, appeared to them and rested each on each one of them. I, I want us to see the entrance of the spirit because the context here is pointing us to something great. And oftentimes we read this and we miss what the author is intending for us to understand about the coming of the Spirit. You have imagery and you use similes of wind and fire here. And this is the reason why. This is the reason that Luke is recording this in such a way and gleaning some Old Testament theological context and content in order for the reader to understand that this truly is the Spirit of God. And this is why. I give you a ton of verses, but it would take too long. Let's look at a few of them. Exodus 40, verses 34 and 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Skipping down. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up for the cloud, that the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel through all their journeys. Second Chronicles goes like this. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, if you want to write that down. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering. There's the wrath. And the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. There's something taking place here that Luke is contextually pointing back to the Spirit's work in the Old Testament. This wind or this cloud or this pneuma uh, and this tongue of fire is coming in and residing where? In the room or on the person? Let's keep going. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 2. Then he led me to the gates, the gates facing east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Haggai 2, 6 through 8. For thus the Lord of hosts says, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in and will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. There is a imagery by simile that is being communicated here, that what is taking place is most certainly the Spirit of God coming and filling 
something. But you see that it is not a tabernacle. It is not a tent of meeting. It is not a temple that is being filled. It is on the individual. And what does the prophet tell us from old? That in these last days, that the Spirit of God is going to come in a different way. It's not to fill up houses of worship. It's not to fill up stone and mortar and buildings. But it is to indwell the believer himself. And we know from other parts of the New Testament, specifically Hebrews, that this is the sign and the seal of salvation. The Holy Spirit's indwelling a person is the seal of salvation. How do I know if I'm saved? Have you repented and believed? And are you indwelt with the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes, then you are saved. We can trust and hope in the promises of God that the Spirit seals us until that last day for salvation, that we are his. And if we truly believe there is nothing, no principality, no power that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Can't happen. We are his. Christ will have those whom he died for. You should think about that phrase for the next 50 years. Christ will have those for whom he died for. Nothing is going to keep Christ from saving those whom he knew before the foundation of the world. And this is not in the context of, well, he's just going to save these people or these people. No, that was written so that we might have certainty of our salvation, that we might be comforted and encouraged that Christ has saved us, that we might remind ourselves that though Christ can pick anyone he wants, and though no sin can come between us and God if it is satisfied by the wrath of God on the person of Christ, that we are sealed by the Spirit. And our sin has been sunk to the bottom of the depths of the sea. It has been put behind God's back. The scripture says he remembers it no more. This should be an encouragement to us this morning that God has dealt with sin. And the Spirit furthers that and indwells us and seals us for salvation until that last day when Christ returns and makes all things new. I also want us to see, uh, and this isn't in my notes, but I thought about it and I'm going to repeat it uh, because I've said it before, that what the Spirit is also doing is reversing the curse. I remind you that the miracles of Christ uh, are to not necessarily just to produce miracles. Uh, He didn't come just to produce miracles. Uh, There is a reason that Jesus produces miracles. One, and the primary one, is to glorify God and to show that he had authority from heaven. Uh, That Jesus came and he spoke with authority, the people said. But we also see a secondary characteristic of those miracles. And it is a reversal of the curse and the stain of sin. We see that sin has corrupted all of the universe. Everything that God created is now in a fallen state. And we see in Genesis chapter 3 that a curse has entered the ground. And that curse extends to all of us that we are now susceptible to sin, and apart from that, we are also all sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus in his miracles, as a secondary characteristic, show us that he has come to reverse that which has gone wrong. And we see glimpses of that reversal. The lame man walks Those who had demons oppress and possess them were cast 
out. Demons were cast out. Those who could not see are able to see. And much more than that, and more importantly, we see this with the man who was lowered down. Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. So what has gone wrong, not only on a physical level, Jesus is also fixing that on that last day, but now he is fixing on a spiritual level. He is doing something about sin so that we might break free from the captivity that we are in, in our sin, by his death, burial, and resurrection, of course. But we also see a reversal of the curse here. If we go back to Genesis, uh, as we were in for quite a while uh, last year, uh, we see a story about people who wanted to make a name for themselves. And what do they do? That's a consistent theme throughout the first 11 chapters of Genesis. People wanting to make a name for themselves. Uh, and if we aren't careful, oftentimes, even as believers, we will steer towards wanting to make a name for ourselves and not making the name of Jesus great as we are commanded and commissioned to do. It all goes back to my phrase, are we building the kingdom of God or are we too concerned with our own kingdom? Well, these people here who were building the city were concerned with themselves and what they could do and what they could produce and they were building a tower up to the heavens. And we see that God comes down he sees what's taking place. He sees that the consistent theme of people taking their own fate in their own hands in doing what they wanted to do and making a great name for themselves, naming cities after themselves, all of this sort of thing, he comes down and he confuses their language. He stirs up division, and they are no longer able to do what they set out to do. And yet here, in Acts chapter 2, as one of the cancellations of the curse, we see that the Spirit comes and language is now not a problem. Language is now not a problem because we see what takes place. Look at verse four. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What is taking place here? Because if you go to a certain church or a different church, uh, this answer may widely vary depending where you are, who you're listening to. Uh, but the text is clear. In the book of Acts, the text is clear, especially here in chapter 2, that what is taking place is that the Holy Spirit has come and dwelt the heart of a believer and allowed for that person to speak a language otherwise unknown to them. Well, how do we know that? Well, it tells you the languages that they were speaking in the following verses. Look at verse five. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of the multitude came together, bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. God orchestrated for all of the nations surrounding this one city to descend upon this city for this festival. And yet the spirit comes on this particular day on Pentecost, the Feast of Shabbat, and what takes place. Each one of these people who did not speak the language was hearing the apostles and those with the apostles speak in their own native tongue. And the question is, is what languages are represented here? Well, it tells us Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Figura, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors of Rome. Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. Now, what's the message? This is one of my favorite verses of all scripture. Look at what it says. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. This is the message of the gospel. What God has done through history past and what he is doing in history present and what he will do in history future. The mighty works of God. The grand narrative of scripture of God creating a place for his people in which his presence might 
dwell. This is what God is doing. And these are the mighty works of God, that God would take sinners like you and I in our cosmic rebellion against him, thinking we know better than him, doing what we want to do, making a name for ourselves, And he brings us out of that and into his wondrous light, saves us from our sin by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross, and empowers us to come alongside his purpose for us and his plan throughout all of history to make a people for himself so that in eternity future, for the rest of all of our eternity, we will all nations be represented around the throne of God. This is what he has asked us to participate in. And not only that, he offers the spirit of God in order so that we might fulfill what he has asked us to do. So we, not of anything that we have, he saves us, nothing that we can contribute, not our merit, uh, not our good works, because they are as filthy rags before him. So he saves us with no contribution from ourselves. And not only that, he asks us to participate in his plan throughout all of Scripture to make his name great, to bring the nations under his rule, in his kingdom. And he doesn't just say, do your best. He empowers us by the work of the Spirit. This is what he is doing. Three things. I'm going long. Three things about the role of the Spirit. Uh, we see these three things. First, we see the unity. We saw it beforehand, but now we see it in, uh, in, in a more fulfilled sense, that there's a unifying Spirit, and you'll read about that in the works of Paul uh, and things like that, that the Spirit of Christ unifies us, that we are to be about the same heart and mind with one another, uh, that we need unity in the fellowship of believers. So the role of the Spirit unifies us. We are all sealed with the Spirit, we have the same spirit of Christ indwelling us so that we should be unified because of it. We also see uh, an aspect here of repentance. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So if you read verses 36 and 37, I want you to see the role of the spirit in repentance. Uh, Peter is going to give a sermon, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. He gives a sermon. I want you to see what the spirit of God does in regards to repentance to the crowd. This is how he finishes. Both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's telling the crowd, this Jesus is the person that you crucified just 50 some odd days ago. You killed this guy. He's the Messiah. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. And you killed him. This is not a politically correct sermon that Peter is giving at this point. This is not PC in the slightest. He's accusing these people before him of killing the Son of God. And yet, this is what Scripture says about us. Because of our sin, Jesus died. Because of our sin, Jesus died. Your sin sent Jesus to the cross. And yet, you didn't make him go. He did so willingly. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. But this is what Peter tells them. This Jesus whom you crucified. I love the next verse, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were what? Cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? As a side note, if you've never repented from your sin and the Spirit of God cuts you to the heart, because that's what happens oftentimes when you come to church, you hear the pastor and you're cut to the heart, and you could believe and repent and put your faith in Christ, 
or you could just take that little cut, let it heal up. But there's a hardness that's going to come to your heart. There's a hardness that will come to your heart if you continually go to church, hear the gospel proclaimed, and refuse to repent. So the answer that he says in verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That response even rings true today. What should I do when confronted with my own sin by the work of the Spirit, by hearing the word of God proclaimed, understanding that I am a sinner, that I sent Christ to the cross, the very Son of God, yet who went willingly, who was set aside before the foundations of the world were laid and died in my place. What should I do? And the answer is the same, repent and believe. Put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus. He has suffered the wrath of God for you so that you might not suffer it for all of eternity. And we see the third one. So a unity of believers We see repentance, and that repentance extends past that first initial repentance where we trust and believe because as Christians, as believers in Christ Jesus, we are not perfect. The Spirit is still working on us. We are still undergoing repentance over and over and over as we fail. So the Spirit of God not only points you towards the fact that we ought to repent and believe, but it points us to the fact that we ought to continue to repent. I've said this before, that the mark of a Christian is someone who continually repents for the rest of your life. You continually repent. Confronted with your own sinfulness, you repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. And the third one we see is a boldness to witness. Boldness to witness. And for most of us, this is the one that we should be thinking about this morning. If the spirit of God that raised Christ from the grave is indwelling us, has sealed us for salvation, and who was able to empower these cowards, and these apostles in the first century to go out and to proclaim the mighty works of God, then we should realize and understand that that same spirit will send us out if we are obedient and give us a boldness to witness to this lost and dying world. He empowers us to do the same. I've done many types of uh, evangelical programs, and I'm sure this church, uh, from what I have heard in the past, you've done evangelism explosion, you've done all of these types of things, and programs are great. Uh, I'm not saying that they are bad. Apart from the Spirit of God, they will not do anything. And yet, even in these programs, even in our own efforts uh, to witness to others, if we are not praying and relying upon the Spirit to do something through us, then we will do nothing good in our own might. We ought to rely on the Spirit. And that gives us a level of expectation that we have a boldness to go and be obedient because it's not us doing the work. It's God who does the work. God will save those for whom Christ died for. All we have to do is proclaim the message. All we have to do is be obedient and proclaim the message of the mighty works of God. What God has done from Genesis chapter 1 and what he continues to do even unto this day. We just have to be obedient and proclaim the good news, the mighty works of God. That even in your sinfulness, Christ has died for you. That he offers you something far greater than you can possibly imagine. And that is everlasting life 
And the everlasting life is not the good part. The good part is that you will be with Christ, your creator, forever. We're going back to the garden, but we're going back to a better garden. We will walk in the coolness of the day with him again if we are believers in Christ Jesus. This is the promise that he has for us. And unfortunately, I have eight more pages. So we should end here. Otherwise, we'll be getting out into the next hour or two. This morning, I want to reiterate that the work of the Spirit was not for the first century church. The Spirit is a necessity for us today, and it's also a reality for us today because apart from the Spirit of God, None of us are sealed for salvation. So those who are believers in him, we can stake our lives upon his word. The promise of God that he will send the spirit, the paraclete, the helper to be with us. And unlike the Old Testament where the spirit kind of came and left uh, and uh, was here a certain time. No, the spirit is for us until Christ returns. So the question is, is are we leaning upon, are we relying on the Spirit of God, not only to do a great and mighty work in our own lives, but to do a great and mighty work through us in the lives of others?